The following program is brought to you by the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists and by Hope Channel in cooperation with this network. Welcome to this special Hope Channel series on Revival and Reformation. Throughout this entire week at this time, we're broadcasting a series of programs which are an earnest appeal for every one of us as individuals who love God to come closer to God in a deeper experience of revival and reformation. To launch this entire week-long series is Pastor Ted Wilson. Ted, we're so glad that you're with us today. Pastor Wilson is the president of the World Seventh Adventist Church. And Pastor Wilson, a few months ago in the city of Atlanta, at our World Conference, made a world invitation for our members to be revived and renewed and to experience reformation in their life. And then, most recently, at our World Church Annual Council, he again echoed that, appealing for individuals for revival and reformation. And so it's in this series that we bring to you these heartfelt messages. Ted, let me ask a question before you go to preach and to present this first presentation. What does revival and reformation mean to Pastor Ted Wilson personally? Well, revival and reformation may sound to some people like some kind of a checklist, legalistic way of trying to find your way to heaven. But I want to tell you what it really means is to to humble yourself before the Lord. And I want to do that. That's, that's, that is what it means to me personally. Sure. To truly understand my relationship with Jesus. It's not something that we manufacture ourselves. It is only something which the Holy Spirit will bring. And we have to ask the question, why are we still here? Yes. The Lord wants to come. So there must be something that's holding Him back. And I just want to commit myself completely to Him and humble myself, pray and study God's Word, and let Him use me to speak to other people. And that's what it means to me. Well, thank you. I, I think uh, with that brief introduction, I'd like to have prayer. And that we would ask that God would bless you as you go, and because I know you have a thrilling presentation for us, a very heartfelt presentation. So I'd like to pray with you. Thank and you, And ask that God would bless all of us and open our hearts to the message that He has for you. Our Heavenly Father, we lift our hearts to you just now, recognizing that as human beings we're finite and you are infinite. You have a message for us today with the words of Pastor Ted Wilson. We ask that you would bless his mind, anoint his lips, that we might hear the message that you have for us. Please speak to our hearts personally and make practical this message of revival and reformation. And we thank you. In the name of Jesus, our precious Savior, I pray. Amen. It's a great privilege for me to greet you this Sabbath morning, December 25. This is the day celebrated in much of the world as the birthday of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And in this holiday season, as the old year comes to an end and the new year is soon to begin, I want to wish you God's richest blessing. My prayer for you is that you will experience good health, many blessings, and a prosperous spiritual growth in this new year. This season of the year is the time when we particularly remember the birth of Christ. Although we don't worship the day December 25, there's nothing sacred about that day except it is the Sabbath today and that is sacred, we certainly do honor the incarnation of Jesus and thank God for His love and compassion for us. Today I'd like to study a Bible passage with you. It's a beautiful section found in that wonderful book, Philippians, and in chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. And I invite you to follow along with me in the Bible as we study this passage together. 
Philippians 2 outlines the steps Jesus took for our salvation. I want to reflect on these steps and how they practically apply in our lives as we too follow Jesus in a dynamic relationship with Him. The sermon today is the first part of a one-week series that has been especially prepared for you by our Revival and Reformation team and the Hope Channel. I invite you to tune in to the Hope Channel, 3ABN, and other networks carrying this series and share in the presentations of Revival and Reformation each day this coming week. Now tomorrow, Pastor Derek Morris will speak. On the following days, Pastors C.D. Brooks, Doug Batchelor, Dwight Nelson, Jose Rojas, and Mark Finley will share God's Word. On Friday evening, a special prayer report has been prepared and will be a wonderful blessing just for you. Next Sabbath, I have the great privilege of sharing another study with you live from the Generation of Youth for Christ Convention from Baltimore, Maryland. We're presenting this series to encourage you at the beginning of this new year in the experience of rededicating your life, rededicating my life in a deeper way to God for this new year. Recently, the leadership of the World Seventh-day Adventist Church met at our annual council. Our number one agenda item was what we have called Revival and Reformation. As we consider the times in which we live, with what we know of the spiritual condition of our own lives, of our church, and the phenomenal opportunities for evangelism, and the relatively few resources we have to accomplish all of this, your church leaders have urgently felt the need for each of us to have a closer walk with God, and to plead with the Lord for revival and reformation leading to the latter reign of the Holy Spirit. Please understand, my dear brothers and sisters, it is only through the power of the Holy Spirit that we can have revival and reformation. It is not something that we can mechanically produce. We must lean completely on the power of the Holy Spirit. We must be revived and changed by the power of the Lord so that we can be ready for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in fulfillment of Joel 2, Acts 2, and Hosea 6. Revival is a daily renewal of our spiritual life with God. And Reformation is allowing God to change and transform our life to become more and more like Jesus. God has promised a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit in what the Bible describes as the latter rain, just before the second coming of Jesus. I believe, you believe, we believe that Jesus is coming soon. In God's great plan for this universe, only He knows the exact time of Jesus' coming, but we can hasten Christ's coming. We can participate with heaven in proclaiming this great message. We need to be ready, and we appeal to each person to experience revival and reformation, praying for the latter rain. We want to be part of the wise group listed in Matthew 25 who are spiritually awake and filled with the Holy Spirit waiting for Jesus to come. How do we have a life of revival in our own personal experience? What will motivate us to be like our precious Savior, Jesus? This is why I believe the message of Philippians chapter 2 speaks to us today. I just love this passage. I invite you to join me as we read from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, and this is being read from the New International Version. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. You see, here the Apostle Paul is saying, 
if you have sensed in your heart the joy of being united with Jesus, if you have been comforted and encouraged by this, if you have sensed a fellowship with others who love Jesus and are seeking to keep all of His commandments and be ready for Jesus' second coming, then Paul appeals to you and me to have a deeper unity of spirituality and mission, to find our true understanding in our relationship with Christ. Now, the first characteristic of the path Jesus followed for our salvation was the path characterized by unity. Heaven was united for our salvation. When we consider the plan of redemption and how God provided for our need of salvation, it was based on the unity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, committing themselves to giving Heaven's very best for our salvation, for your salvation, for my salvation. John 3, 16, a very familiar text to each of us, puts it this way, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Unitedly they gave. The angels, the cherubim, the seraphim, united with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit to bring salvation to this planet which was in rebellion. Heaven was united. Satan in his rebellion filled heaven with division and discord, and he still attempts to do that in the church and in our own lives. The book of Revelation tells us that there was war in heaven over sin. God lost one-third of His family. Among the loyal angels, serious questions were raised about the character of God. Sin brought disunity, discord, separation, and war. It does that in families when we allow it. Don't allow the devil to tempt you into discord and disunity. Keep your eyes focused upon Christ. Now in heaven, one purpose, one goal fills heaven. For men and women, boys and girls, to be saved and be part of God's great family. What a beautiful thought. Regardless of nationality, ethnicity, language, or culture, one family united in Jesus Christ. This unity was heaven's goal when Jesus came 2,000 years ago. Today, as you and I follow the path that Jesus walked to provide our salvation, we must be committed to the same unity that heaven is committed to. If we're going to be part of the redeemed, we too will have unity. Around the world, there are many forces that tend to pull God's people apart and destroy the unity of God's church. Today, I echo this strong biblical appeal for unity among God's people around the world. Seventh-day Adventists are not primarily bound together by institutions or policies or actions by an annual council or an inflexible creed. We are a worldwide movement, a worldwide fellowship of believers who believe the Bible is the Word of God. The Bible indicates that Thy Word is truth. The truth unites us because the Holy Spirit, we are told, will lead us into all truth. We believe it was God who created this world and everything in it in six literal contiguous days, ending with the seventh-day Sabbath of rest, as God has commanded us as a memorial or a commemoration of His creative power. We believe Jesus is God in the fullest sense, and that He loved us so much that He came and lived a perfect life, died for each of us, rose to life, and is ministering as our heavenly high priest today in the heavenly sanctuary. What a wonderful mediator! What a wonderful God! We believe God's loyal disciples will keep all Ten Commandments, including the Fourth Commandment, asking for us to remember the seventh day as God's Sabbath because of our love for Jesus. We believe that Jesus is coming soon, and we must fulfill the mission of Jesus to take the gospel to the entire world, proclaiming 
the three angels' messages of Revelation 14. And if you haven't reviewed those precious messages, I encourage you to take your Bible and to look those up. Revelation 14, 6 to 12, powerful verses that are applicable for today. The spiritual unity of commitment to the person of Jesus, His holy word, His mission, His mediatorial ministry in the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary right now, and His soon second coming is what essentially binds us together as Seventh-day Adventist people. Certainly it is the Holy Spirit leading God's people that keeps us together in this Advent movement. Today, a variety of forces would divide the church, and we must be bold and intentional to maintain and build the unity of the church. Jesus warned of factors that would divide His people. Jesus said there would be the cares of this world. What are they? Well, rampant consumerism, secularism, materialism, an inordinate fascination with technology, the increasing intensity in our pace of life. We just don't have time for God. I want to tell you, take time in the morning or whenever you can to spend with Jesus. Let a thoughtful hour, a thoughtful period of time be given to studying God's Word, praying, and connecting yourself with heaven. Business and professional preoccupations may sometimes keep us away from that connection. None of these things may be wrong in and of themselves, but these, quote, cares can pull us away from a deep personal relationship with Jesus. God calls for us to prioritize our relationship and service for Him. If we do not accept the Bible as God's authoritative revelation, the resulting confusion can divide us. If we accept the premise that the Bible contains the Word of God rather than it being the Word of God, we reduce the Bible to just idle tales of folklore subject to unending forms of individual interpretation. Seventh-day Adventists believe the Bible is the Word of God and that its teachings are true and authoritative for the believer, for you and for me. If we minimize the mission of Christ, this also becomes divisive. We are lulled by the bombardment of media to think the catastrophic events happening all around us are just normal, the way the world has always been. And so we slack off. We lose our zeal. We gradually become less and less intentional and creative to share the three angels' messages, lifting up Jesus in all of His beauty, pointing to His righteousness, which is what the three angels' messages are all about turning people back to the true worship of God. But this kind of is an anesthetic. It creates a spiritual state that is not what God wants. We're kind of lulled into sleep, anesthetized. Everywhere we turn, we see the signs of the Second Coming, and they are exponentially multiplying. They shout to us that Jesus is coming soon. We build unity as we fulfill the mission of Christ. In the words of the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 2, if you have received any encouragement by being united with Christ, I appeal for you to be united with Jesus and His people today in a deeper way. Now, if you've been comforted by His love, then unite with Jesus and His church in deeper unity. If the Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart in love and compassion, and in the words of Paul, be like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Unity is one of the ways we walk with Jesus in the path for our salvation. Now, coming back to our text in Philippians 2, let's read verses 3 through 8. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit but in humility consider others better than yourselves. 
Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider it equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death on a cross. The Apostle Paul now appeals for us to be humble, just like Jesus was. Imagine a ladder. Most of us have used a ladder. Not a ladder to climb up, but a ladder to climb down. Jesus climbed down the ladder of condescension, coming from heaven itself all the way down to this earth for our salvation, to save you, to save me. He was a humble God. It would have been a huge condescension for Jesus to take the nature of an angel, maybe a seraphim or a cherubim. But on his way down, he did not stop to take the nature of an angel. It would have been a great humility for Jesus to have taken the nature of Adam before he sinned, but on his way down to save us, he did not stop where Adam was created. The book, The Desire of Ages, page 49, indicates that Jesus accepted humanity when the race had been weakened by 4,000 years of sin. Like every child of Adam, he accepted the results of the working of the great law of heredity. What these results were is shown in the history of his earthly ancestors. He came with such a heredity to share our sorrows and temptations and to give us the example of a sinless life. It would have been an amazing step down if Jesus had come to this earth as a king, a noble, a prince, or a talented artist, but he didn't stop there. When Jesus came, he came as the poorest of the poor to the manger of Bethlehem to be sheltered in the arms of a young peasant girl, welcomed by shepherds, and to live the hand-to-mouth existence of a first-century carpenter. Believe it or not, Jesus did not stop there. He was willing to put aside his unity with the Godhead, his love and commitment to save us, to save you, to save me. I want this to become very personal. Jesus came to save us as individuals. He came from that exalted heavenly position to this earth. After 33 and a half years of perfect living, teaching, and healing, the Almighty God of the universe, who had mysteriously taken the nature of fallen humanity, said, My time is now come. And he stepped down lower, lower, lower on the ladder of humility to the very bottom and humbled himself to that of a slave, a servant. And then, ultimately, unbelievably, the king of the universe humbling himself to the death on the cross by crucifixion. He was humbled by the betrayal of Judas, humbled by the blasphemous denial of Peter, humbled by lying witnesses before the highest tribunal of the nation, humbled before Pilate, the governor of the Roman Empire in that region, humbled through mock worship and brutal physical abuse by the Roman guard, humbled by being stripped of his clothes and shamefully hung naked on a cross between heaven and earth. This is what Jesus did for you and for me, for our salvation. The path Jesus took for our salvation was the path 
of humility. The Bible calls for us, his disciples, to be humble as well. To be humble means we recognize our position before God and are willing to accept his prescription for our need. It means we're willing to recognize we are sinners and that we desperately need a Savior. It means we're willing, despite of our education, sophistication, wealth, background, culture, whatever it is, our worldly prestige, to kneel at the foot of the cross and from our hearts cry out like the publican, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. It means we're willing to accept the convicting, teaching, guiding, instructive work of the Holy Spirit in our own personal lives. It means we're willing to accept the simple, straightforward authority of the complete Bible as the authoritative voice of God, speaking to our hearts and minds, regardless of doubts and skepticisms that other sources may suggest. It means to accept that God is the Almighty God and we are His creation. In the words of the prophet Micah, beautiful verse, chapter 6, verse 8, He has showed you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? Three things. To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. What a marvelous text. I love that text. It's so simple and yet so profound. Dear fellow believer, we need humility. I need humility. We need to walk humbly as Jesus, our Savior, did. You see, we need to lean completely on Christ for our salvation. Christ is our righteousness. Let us not look to ourselves for righteousness, but only to Jesus Christ. One of the most eloquent promises of God's blessing, if we are humble, is found in 1 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. I love this verse. It was a verse God speaking to Solomon, and it said right there, if my people, do you include yourself as part of God's people? If my people, who are called by my name, do you, do you name yourself as part of God's people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, to seek God's face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. God will heal not only our land, He will heal our hearts, He will heal our broken relationships, He will heal our relationship with Him. What a wonderful promise based on humbling ourselves before Him and praying to Him. As indicated before, the World Seventh-day Adventist Church at our recent annual council took extra time in our deliberations to pray for revival and reformation. Why did we do this? What are the reasons that we see for revival being vital to the church? Well, let me share two of many reasons. First of all, it's our collective lack of personal spirituality. The World Seventh-day Adventist Church commissioned major scientific studies, which included questions to members about their personal spirituality. These questions were anonymous, so no person is identified. But of the thousands of members surveyed, the results showed the following. Only 51% of church members regularly study this precious book, the Bible. Only 53% regularly pray. I want to just testify personally. I cannot understand how one can get along, get along in this very difficult life without praying. I count on prayer personally every day. Only 55% of this group that was surveyed witnessed for their faith. So you see, my friends, Bible study, prayer, 
and witness are key elements of personal spirituality. They are absolutely vital. Now who can deny we are in need of revival and reformation when only approximately 50% of our believers are active in Bible study and prayer? All of us, as Scripture tells us in the book of Revelation, are part of Laodicea. We are in need of God's special attention, of God's eye salve, of His robe of righteousness. We are in need of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't share those statistics that we just went over to discourage you. I share them to inform you so that you understand why we as church leaders believe revival is so vitally important not only in your life but in my life. How can we be God's end time people if we don't take time to know God every day? How can we be ready to welcome Jesus at the second coming if we don't know Him in our hearts today? I share this appeal to your heart that you personally will humble yourself before God. Prioritize your life utilizing prayer and the study of God's Word in your own personal experience. This is the driving reason why we've adopted the worldwide Holy Spirit Prayer and Fellowship Plan, the 777 Initiative. This worldwide Holy Spirit Prayer and Fellowship Plan is an invitation for you to join millions of fellow Seventh-day Adventists around the world to pray seven days a week at seven o'clock for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter which seven o'clock, in the morning, in the evening, in fact, both times. Seventh-day Adventists praying seven days a week at seven in the morning and seven in the evening praying around the clock at 7 o'clock. Will you do it? Will you join your brothers and sisters in a deeper prayer experience? I've learned how someone does this. He carries a, a smartphone, his cellular phone, and he has set the alarm to ring twice a day at 7 a.m. in the morning and at 7 p.m. in the evening. And when the alarm reminds him that he needs to pray, he simply pauses and prays, Lord, please send the Holy Spirit into my life. Now, not everybody carries a smartphone or a cellular phone, but all of us can pray. And let me tell you, prayer is the best kind of cell phone. You don't need any technology. You don't need any electrical power. You have a direct access to heaven. Utilize it. Pray. Join with me and millions of others to humbly pray for the Holy Spirit. Now, the second major reason why your church leaders have so strongly given their support for revival and reformation is because of the amazing doors of opportunity opening for us to share and proclaim the three angels' messages to the world. We see such amazing providential openings that the church has never, ever had before, and in comparison, our resources are so small that it is driving us to our knees, pleading for God to pour out the Holy Spirit and empower God's people to take advantages of these huge opportunities. Let me share just three examples of these opportunities for witnessing and proclaiming God's message that have recently developed for God's church. First, Adventist World Radio. Their mission is to reach the hardest to reach people in their local languages. These broadcasts reach language groups often where it is impossible for a missionary to go physically. AWR reports that in one trouble-torn country that I will not publicly name, that AWR broadcasts in that language area are more popular than one of the most popular international news broadcasts in that language. It's amazing. It's incredible. What a spiritual hunger this indicates. Another fact, within four months of AWR launching their new podcast service, 
they are getting a huge wave of response. Amazingly, Arabic, Indonesian, even Amharic languages have tens of thousands of subscribers for all new releases. Think how God is planting gospel seeds. Think of the spiritually hungry individuals this represents. Did you know that in the staunchly Hindu kingdom of Nepal, that AWR is broadcasting on local radio stations in 15 of the major cities of that country and all in the Nepali language? This was not even possible a few years ago. God is opening amazing doors. Secondly, a second illustration of new opportunities that is absolutely amazing is the evangelistic work in our Adventist educational system and what it accomplishes. Dr. Lisa Beardsley, the director of our World Education Department at the General Conference, reports that globally 1.7 million students in nearly 8,000 schools are receiving a Seventh-day Adventist-based education. 112 of these are colleges and universities, and four new medical and dental schools are in the planning stages. We praise the Lord that as evangelism expands, the need for Christian education, Seventh-day Adventist Christian education, is explosive. What an opportunity to provide our unique Seventh-day Adventist education for millions of people and thousands are baptized every year from these schools. We need more church and school buildings to accommodate this growth, and I'm so grateful for the many initiatives of many within the church to provide new church and school buildings. The organization called ASI and Maranatha Volunteers International have teamed together to provide many thousands of buildings. This is outstanding. I want to thank ASI and Maranatha for the wonderful job they are doing and many others in a very similar situation. But today we need more godly teachers in our schools. Pastors, teachers, and specialists are needed. We need teachers with advanced degrees who humbly and faithfully share the Bible as believing professors who teach and instruct in these institutions using the Bible as it reads as their guide. Young people, we need you to dedicate your life to service, service to God to advance His work. What a huge opportunity there is for evangelism. And thirdly, just a few days ago, on December 15, Hope Channel, which is providing this broadcast for the World Church, began broadcasting on its new North Africa Middle East Channel covering all of Europe, North Africa, the Middle East, and Central Asia, this channel will broadcast the three angels' messages full-time in three languages, Arabic, Turkish, and Farsi. Praise God. A development like, like this is only something our pioneers dreamed of in the past. I was raised in Egypt, a wonderful place. I had the opportunity of spending about the first eight years of my life in that wonderful country. My father was the leader of our Seventh-day Adventist work in Egypt for many years. And I know firsthand of the many challenges our church has had in sharing the gospel in this region. To now be able to broadcast Hope Channel full-time with our unique message, lifting up Christ and the three angels' messages is absolutely amazing. What is God doing? Very soon, Hope Channel, in the next few weeks, will open another new full-time Hope Channel in the Mandarin language for China and a third full-time Hope Channel for India, broadcasting in the Hindi, Tamil, and Telugu languages. And with these developments, the current Hope Channel Europe will transition to primarily a Russian language channel to serve the vast areas of Eastern Europe, Russia, and Central Asia. These new channels for the Middle East, China, India, and Russia are targeted to reach the very difficult territories 
of what we call the 1040 window, sharing the three angels' messages in that very needy area. The population of these areas is approximately 3 billion people. Never before in the history of the church have we been able to proclaim God's message to so many people in such an easy manner for them to view it. These tremendous avenues that God has opened up to us of radio, education, and television, and all other means of witness and ministry, and there are many others, including publishing and so many other areas of personal witness and public a proclamation. They are preparing millions to understand and accept the precious message God has entrusted to His people, lifting up Christ in His righteousness, lifting up the three angels' messages, pointing people to the end of time and Jesus soon coming. What is God doing? Why, why are all these things happening right now? And why has technology been opened to us and allowing us to reach millions in new and very open ways. Why is God doing this at this time in Earth's history? Well, these are unparalleled new opportunities for God's church. And the more I see these opportunities, the more I realize that what little we can do is just a little speck compared to the opening for the gospel that God is developing and preparing for His people in the very near future. Are you willing to be part of this great Advent movement that is going to see the fulfillment of God's great plan through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the latter rain? We need God's Holy Spirit to work in an unusual way to take advantage of these opportunities for mission. Dear fellow believer, we thank God for your faithful prayers, your faithful financial support, your faithful witnessing. God has blessed His church through your faithfulness and your liberality in returning your tithes and your offerings. But friends, in proportion to the needs and opportunities God is opening, we are woefully short of supplying these needs. The need is very great. The only answer is God's providential intervention and only prayer will open our hearts and prepare us as to how God will provide these answers. The needs are far beyond us, humanly speaking. Can you understand now why we feel such a need for prayer, revival, and reformation? The need of mission is far greater than any human capacity. Only God can meet this need. We need to humble ourselves before God. And I'm starting with myself. I want to humbly bow before my Savior and Master and allow Him to use me as He sees best. As we turn to our text again in Philippians chapter 2, we find the next step in the path that Jesus walked for our salvation. We now read Philippians 2, 9 to 11. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. When Jesus was resurrected and ascended to heaven, thank God He did not go back to heaven defeated. He went back victorious. The doors of heaven were opened wide. The angels that had adored Him before He left heaven for this earth joyously welcomed Him back home. The angels that had watched over him while on earth now crowded excitedly around him. Jesus was victorious. Praise God, he is the victor. He had come to the dominion of Satan here on this earth. He met Satan on his own turf. He had taken the nature of fallen man and by the same power available to all of us, Jesus was victorious 
over Satan. He lived a pure life, died a death, and now as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, he swept through the gates of the New Jerusalem up along those golden streets and there he was welcomed by the Father and received the assurance that his humility and his sacrifice, his perfect life in behalf of fallen man was sufficient and accepted. What a wonderful plan of salvation. In fact, brothers and sisters, we are going to be studying that incredible plan of salvation throughout eternity. It is God's precious gift to us. And then before the vast unnumbered throngs of heaven, Jesus continued his ministry as our high priest, his ministry, the everlasting covenant in the heavenly sanctuary in our behalf. He had come to earth as heaven's ambassador. Now he returned to heaven as humanity's ambassador. What a wonderful thought. He is our mediator. He is our surety. He is the one who defends us. He paid the price and now he is our high priest. Our every need, our every prayer is his top priority and concern. For our salvation, we are completely dependent on Christ and His righteousness. Listen to what the spirit of prophecy, the writings of Ellen G. White, whom I believe was inspired by God, what those writings have to say in manuscript release number 371. Beautiful thought. Man broke God's law, and through the Redeemer, new and fresh promises were made on a different basis. All blessings must come through a mediator. Now every member of the human family is given wholly into the hands of Christ, and whatever we possess, whether it is the gift of money, of houses, of lands, of reasoning powers, of physical strength, of intellectual talents, in this present life, and the blessings of the future life are placed in our possession as God's treasures to be faithfully expended for the benefit of man. And listen to this. Every gift, and I continue to quote, every gift is stamped with the cross and bears the image and superscription of Jesus Christ. All things come of God. From the smallest benefits up to the largest blessing, all flow through the one channel, a superhuman dedication sprinkled with the blood that is of value beyond estimate because it was the life of God in His Son. And what was Christ's goal? To unite His family that was back on earth, to unite them with His family that was in heaven. There in the heavenly courts He was installed at the right hand of the Father, there standing beside the throne fully accepted and recognized as victor and king of kings. The first Christian martyr Stephen looked into heaven just before he died and saw all the hosts of heaven bowing before Christ, this victor and this king of kings. And they were all confessing that Jesus is Lord. You can read that in Acts chapter 7. Christ was victorious. And what was his prayer? What was Jesus' prayer? Why he prayed for you and me? He prayed that we would join him in heaven. Jesus prayed in John 17, verse 24. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Jesus was victorious and he wants you and me to be victorious. He wants us to join him in heaven and be with him as his honor guard throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. His victory is to be our victory. His exaltation to be our exaltation. He wants his family in heaven and on earth to be one, to be united. Friends, that's why Jesus came 2,000 years ago, for us to be victorious through Him. I invite you today, wherever you are, wherever you may be watching or listening to this sermon, 
to join with me in seeking God for a deep experience of revival and reformation and the outpouring of the latter reign of the Holy Spirit. I urge you to tune in to Hope Channel or on whatever network you are watching this broadcast this week and share in the presentations on revival and reformation each day this coming week. As I've indicated, tomorrow Pastor Derek Morris will share with you the Word of God on each day following Pastors C.D. Brooks, Doug Batchelor, Dwight Nelson, Jose Rojas, and Mark Finley will present the Word of God. Then a special prayer report program has been prepared and will be a wonderful blessing to you. Next Sabbath, I'll have the privilege of sharing another study with you live from the Generation of Youth for Christ Convention in Baltimore, Maryland. Today, revival and reformation is our greatest need. For us to be daily revived and fully committed as authentic disciples of Jesus Christ and ready to be used wherever God may choose to use us. I speak to myself as well as you. Let us lean completely on Christ for our every need as we move forward with revival and reformation as we've learned from Philippians chapter 2, Christ humbled himself for our salvation. What a wonderful Savior. Again, listen to the spirit of prophecy speaking in that same manuscript release, number 371. Christ, for our sakes, became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. And any works that man can render to God will be far less than nothingness. My requests are made acceptable only because they are laid upon Christ's righteousness. The idea of doing anything to merit the grace of pardon is fallacy from beginning to end. Lord, in my hand no price I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. My friends, to close our study, I invite you to bow your head with me in prayer and join me in kneeling at the foot of the cross in asking God to take us, to fill us and use us in His work as He has never done before. As we lift up Christ, as we proclaim the three angels' messages, as we help people understand God's Word, as we look forward to the outpouring of the latter rain, and as we anticipate Christ's soon second coming. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we're thrilled by the plan of salvation that has been ordained from even before the foundation of this earth. We marvel at the plan that the Creator Himself would come to this earth and would die for His own creation. It's beyond our understanding, but Lord, help us to accept it by faith and to realize that we need Christ's righteousness in our lives. Help us, Lord, as we plead with you for revival and reformation in our own lives. We anticipate the latter rain coming in the very near future. And so, Lord, I just commit myself completely into your care. I, I just place all of those who are listening into your care as well. Father, accept us, not through the merits that we have, but through the love, the grace, and the power of our wonderful Savior, our best friend, and our coming King, Jesus Christ. Amen. In Hebrews 4.12, we are told that God's Word is living and active. It is sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. I understand this to mean that God's Word brings changes in a person's life. I want this transforming power to affect mine. I invite you, my fellow believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, to join me in allowing God to change us for His glory and honor, thus bringing revival and reformation in the body of Christ the Church. Will you join me?
Join the World Seventh-day Adventist Church in starting the new year right. Jesus is coming soon, and before He returns, the Holy Spirit will be poured out in a powerful way. Revival and reformation are necessary to receive the Holy Spirit. Start this new year right by taking special time to pray. Ask God to spiritually revive you and your family and lead you even closer to Jesus this coming new year. Welcome back to Revival and Reformation. Friend, I don't know about you, but I personally have been greatly blessed by your presentation, Pastor Wilson. Thank you so much for this inspiring study from the book of Philippians. And this is just really the beginning, isn't it? We have a whole week. That's right. And uh, Powerful every, preaching. Every speaker is going to be talking more and more about this whole theme of revival and reformation. Lifting up the Word of God. That's right. That's, that's where the strength and the power is found. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, tomorrow, we're going to be uh, sharing Pastor Derek Morris, and then following that, Pastor C.D. Brooks, Doug Batchelor, Dwight Nelson, and uh, Jose Rojas, and then Pastor Mark Finley, are all going to be presenting on different evenings. Then we have a special uh, prayer program which, where we're going to be taking you around the world uh, where we're going to be hearing reports about revival and reformation and the earnest appeals that are being made for this experience of uh, coming closer to Jesus and letting Him speak uh, to our hearts. Uh, Pastor Ted, I want to thank you for the message of today. Uh, to look to Jesus as He walked down that ladder of condescension the humility that he had, that was inspirational. Well, praise be to God. It's a wonderful plan of salvation, and we just praise his name and thank God for the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Every one of these topics, friends, is going to be a deep inspiration and appeal to our hearts. It's going to be an invitation for us to walk closer to God. Sometimes revival and reformation is misunderstood. But you're going to hear in these messages a balanced approach that is going to inspire your heart and be deeply practical and meaningful for your life. Now, if you'd like to have more information on this entire series, you need to go to the website, revivalandreformation.org. And I repeat, you've got it there on the screen, revivalandreformation.org. So plan to be with us tomorrow. And you'll enjoy and be blessed by all of this series of programs Thank you again, Pastor Ted, for being with us on this first presentation. We're going to hear you now at the end of the week, and we thank you for in advance for what I know your, God is going to do through you. Friends, revival and reformation is what we need, and so I want to thank you for being with us for this special program on this deeply spiritual topic. God bless you, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. <laughs>